Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And what's more, you, listening right now, have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets to a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And today, let's turn to the pages in your symphony scrapbook that tell about that intriguing instrument, the trombone. And we have as our guest to demonstrate this instrument, Mr. Edward Kleinhammer, member of the trombone section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Kleinhammer, I'm sure our listeners would like to have you identify the selection you played at the opening of this program and uh, perhaps play something more from that symphonic composition. That is a passage from uh, the entry of the gods into Valhalla by Wagner. trombone, I know, is one of the oldest instruments in the orchestra. That is one of the instruments that has been least changed in all its uh, history. And I think most people who attend a symphony concert or a band concert find it's one of the most intriguing instruments in the orchestra or the band to watch. Uh, but I was wondering if you could tell us uh, just how your instrument, uh, that is the trombone, uh, differs from uh, other brass instruments as a matter of construction, valves, playing... Well, the trombone is uh, like a trumpet, we might say, and uh, the main difference between the trumpet and other brass instruments and the trombone is the fact that we lengthen and shorten our tubing by means of a slide, whereas the other brass instruments uh, change the length of their tubings by valves. Uh, that's the, uh, is there any difference in the mouthpiece? Oh, the mouthpiece, of course, is different. The mouthpiece is... Uh, uh, more like a, a large trumpet mouthpiece or a small tuba mouthpiece. It differs, however, uh, from the French horn in, in, in that it's, uh, it's uh, wider and it's not as conical in shape as a French horn mouthpiece. Are um, brass players, or especially uh, trombone players, um, particular about mouthpieces? I know we talk about, say, uh, wind instruments, uh, woodwind instruments, especially the oboes. We find a great fussiness about the reeds that they use. You people the same with mouthpieces? Well, until we find the right mouthpiece, and after that, why, most of the adjustment is within us. Of course, uh, I think everybody knows that the brass instrument in any form, that is trombone, trumpet, tuba, or French horn, is a dangerous in instrument to play because we have to match the vibrations of the lip with the certain length of tubing that we're using, and, of course, uh, we know that uh, now and then there, it doesn't come out like we put it in, and that's what makes it a dangerous instrument. Well, what, uh, what is the range of the trombone? The range of the trombone is about uh, three and a half octaves. Now, you, you're playing a bass trombone. Is there yes. any, what's the difference between that and the regular trombone? The bass trombone has one valve and sometimes two valves, which uh, enable it to play quite a bit lower than the regular trombone. That is, it has half tones which are not on the regular trombone. Well, I was wondering if you could give us a demonstration of the wide range that that instrument covers. Well, I believe that uh, that represents about, um, let's say, more than 50 tones, doesn't it? 50 notes on the, yes. on the scale. That's correct. And uh, there are only about seven positions on the trombone. That's correct. Well, now, how can you produce more than 50 notes out of seven positions? In each position, there's a fundamental tone, and there are many overtones, which we have to adjust with our lip, as I said before. And we have to get the correct vibration for the correct tone that we are asking in this position. Well, now, uh, it's true, isn't it, that a, uh, a trombone player has to have a particularly acute sense of... Uh, of pitch in order to hit the uh, right note? Yes, it, it, it is, uh, compares to a string instrument in that respect that uh, 
our notes are all flexible, and uh, of course we are the only brass instrument that can make a glissando, which uh, can be made also by the stringed instruments, and in that respect, uh, we depend on our ears for placement of the notes. In other words, there can't be any uh, sliding into the note. Uh, we try not to, yes. Well, now, uh, what is the difficulty involved in going from one note to another? Is there any sp specific difficulty? Well, it uh, the main difficulty would be in trying to uh, uh, get from one note to the other with sufficient speed to, uh, to compete, for instance, with a trumpet or a French horn that uses valves. While the note is being played, of course, we should not be moving our slide at all, because that would make sort of a glissando if we had moved our slide while the note was being played. So the main difficulty would be getting from one note to the other with speed. And, of course, in the legato passage, we have to use a certain kind of a tongue which doesn't have to be used on a horn, trumpet, or tuba to make a legato passage. Uh, now, what do you mean by saying use a certain type of tongue? We have to use a tongue which will break up a glissando, which uh, will get us from one note to the other with a, uh, uh, a smooth effect so it doesn't make the glissando effect, where on the trumpet you don't have to use a tongue because you use your valves to get from one note to the other. Uh, so playing a trombone is something more than uh, merely taking an instrument and blowing some air into it and pulling a slide back and forth. That's right. It has its challenges, but it's a very interesting instrument. I don't think, I know the ambitious trombonist figures his work will never be done. Well, now, the passage you played at the uh, beginning of this program, I think, um, represents the tone that is a noble, solemn, powerful, uh, sonorous tone that people us usually associate uh, with the trombone. But uh, just a minute or so ago, you mentioned something about a legato passage. Now, is it possible for an instrument like the trombone to play a legato passage? Yes, it is. I wonder if you could illustrate that. I will illustrate a, a legato passage. Uh, I'll play an andante, the andante movement from the Haydn trumpet concerto. mentioned a glissando, and I recall a rhyme that um, someone once sent in to me, something like this, the, the slide for trombones is the means for playing highs, lows, in-betweens. Their dignity will not permit glissando, save in jazz a bit. I think that's it. Well, now, um, then this rhyme is wrong. In other words, you can, in symphonic music, play a uh, glissando? We have calls for it now and then. I will play a, a glissando for the to demonstrate the effect. Uh, in in what type of symphonic literature would uh, you find that used? Well, there is a glissando which uh, had was just played the other night on a television broadcast. Uh, it reminded me of a glissando, and it would be in the saber dance by Cacciaturian. Mm. It'd be are, just a modern music, or uh, this is semi-modern music. You wouldn't yeah. find it in the classical composer. Uh, we have. Uh, Another glissando in uh, Kodali, the uh, uh, the name of the Harianos. Harianos, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but again, uh, using a sort of a um, sophisticated. Uh, That's right. It's a uh, grotesque uh, grotesque uh, um, yes. um, a passage. Well, now I, I don't think uh, many people associate the trombone uh, with solo work. I know there's very little literature for solo trombone, but uh, do you ever play solo passages in symphonic? Literature. Yes, yes, there are, there are many solo passages for a trombone in symphonic literature. Do um, um, you have an illustration, say, of one of those bravura passages? Well, a bravura passage. Mine uh, demonstration would be from pictures at an exhibition. This is a passage from the last movement, which is the Great Gate of Kiev. Uh, and if anybody uh, buys a Chicago Symphony uh, recording of that, they will uh, hear you play that in the recording. Uh. Tell us something about your own instrument. Is the uh, 
a trombone a very expensive instrument to No, the buy. trombone is not a very expensive instrument. Uh, it's comparable to a to a trumpet, or it's not even comparable to comparable to a French horn for expense. And of course, it doesn't uh, come anywhere near the expense of many stringed instruments. Uh, a good bass trombone, I think, costs around three hundred and fifty dollars. Or do you use an American-made instrument? Uh, no, my instrument is a German make. It's a Schmidt from Weimar, Germany. Now, we have uh, four trombonists in the Chicago Symphony. Is it necessary for you men to match your instruments? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent. Uh, however, mine is the only instrument that is not uh, a domestic instrument as far as the section of the orchestra goes. But I feel that uh, for the bass trombone, this has the quality that I, I desire. The other ones don't look upon it as an alien? I don't think so. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, uh, training, how you came into the Chicago Symphony? I uh, got my orchestral training in the Civic Orchestra and studied under Mr. Edward Gefford, who was the first trombone player of the orchestra at that time. In 1940, uh, Leopold Stokowski organized the All-American Youth Orchestra, and I, was, uh, I passed a series of auditions and got into this orchestra. And uh, at the same time I got into the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, there was a vacancy at that time. How long have you been with us? I've been in the orchestra since 1940, and I was gone three years in the service. Well, thanks ever so much, <clears throat> Mr. Kleinhammer, for this interesting demonstration, discussion of a very fine instrument. And uh, now we're happy to send a pair of tickets to a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra uh, to Mr. Charles W. Chalinski of Calumet uh, City. Uh, for his interesting anecdote about the great pianist Ignaz Paderewski, which we are now adding to our scrapbook. It seems that the conclusion of one of his Paderewski's recitals in London, and there were very many of them, uh, the then reigning king, King Edward VII, to please one of the ladies of the court, requested Mr. Paderewski to play his celebrated menuet once more at a private recital. At his third and final refusal, Mr. Paderewski confided to His Majesty that the terms of his contract did not permit him such extra appearances, even with a short encore in private, and he then added, rather sarcastically, you know, some people act just like sheep. Apparently the inc incident was forgotten, but three months later, upon his return home, La Morgus, Mr. Paderewski received seven prize-winning sheep. His Majesty, while attending a stock show, was intrigued by an entry of Australian sheep and to show his approval of Mr. Paderewski's action in the matter of the small encore, His Majesty arranged for the seven sheep to be dispatched to Paderewski with his compliments. And thanks to Mr. Chilinski for his interesting...